Hey everybody, so tomorrow is Thanksgiving. The plan was that Melody and I were gonna take a break and not record this week, but we decided that we wanted to give you guys a little something to listen to while you're baking your pumpkin pies or while you're cleaning up after all your family and friends have gone home. We hope you enjoy this short little episode we put together. Our narrator won't be on here giving us our intro and outro, but he'll be back for the next episode. Melody and I wanted to let you know that one of the biggest things that we are thankful for this year is all of our listeners. Thank y'all for taking the time to listen to us each week or however often that you do. We just appreciate all of you so much. I hope you guys have the best Thanksgiving. Be blessed this week. Enjoy your families. And we look forward to being with y'all next time. Okay, today I'm going to tell you about the story of Lowell Lee Andrews. Okay. Lowell. Isn't that an odd name? It's my husband's middle name. It's my son's middle name, Elijah's, and it was my husband's dad's name. I was going to say, I've heard that name a lot. Oh, okay. I know a lot of older men named that. So in the 1950s, William and Opal Andrews lived about two miles outside of Kansas City, Kansas. They lived in a little town called Walcott. It had a population at the time of about 150. It was mostly just like this vast farmland with little farmhouses kind of dotting the scenery here and there. Mr. Andrews was a mechanic for the Transatlantic Airlines. And then in his spare time, he was a successful farmer Hmm. of about 250 acres. So he was a busy guy. He was a very busy man. In 1958, when this story that we're going to talk about took place, Mr. William Andrews was 50 years old, his wife Opal was 42, and then they had two children, 20-year-old Jeannie Marie and 18-year-old Lowell Lee. They were kind of like the model 1950s Midwestern family, just seemingly very happy. Mm Mm-hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, they worked hard. They weren't rich, but they were pretty comfortable. I'd I'd say kind of like, uh, I don't know, upper middle class okay. by today's Just standards. Just living the American dream. Yeah. Their daughter, Jenny Marie, was a senior at the Oklahoma Baptist University, where she was majoring in home economics. Oh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. She was very popular. She was social. She had lots of friends. She would bring her college friends home and her mom would cook meals for them. And it was just sweet. She was very proud of her little brother, who was her only sibling. And actually, he wasn't little at all. 18-year-old Lowell stood at 6 feet 2 inches and he weighed 260 pounds. Oh, So he was your typical Midwest farm boy. (laughs) He was. And today that probably doesn't sound maybe not too out of the ordinary because we have like, I don't know, one in three adults that are overweight. But back then there was only like a 10% obesity rate. Mm. And people were shorter back then. Right. That, That is true. Yeah. He did stick out. But everybody liked him that knew him and his family. He went to school at Kansas State University, where he was studying zoology. Thanksgiving in 1958, the family had been looking forward to spending that day together. Mr. Andrews had been home to help with some of the preparations because he and some other mechanics at the airline were on a strike with their union over some contract disputes. So he had been home, you know, still working hard, though, putting those hours in at the farm, just, you know, helping Mrs. Andrews prepare for the kids to come home for their holiday meal. And when it finally came, Mrs. Andrews cooked a Thanksgiving feast. Mr. Andrews' mother came over and the family sat down together and enjoyed their Thanksgiving dinner. But at midnight on November 29th, 1958, Lowell Andrews called into what I think is the Wyandotte County Sheriff's Office, and he reported that he had come home and his family had been killed in a robbery. Mm. The officer who was dispatched out to the farmhouse wondered if the operator at the station had somehow misheard 
because I mean, robbery was unheard of out there. Yeah, it doesn't you seem know? like the typical place. Yeah, that's gonna be robbed out in the middle of the farm country. Right, much less murder. Yeah, I mean, it just it was it's really far fetched. He rushed out to the scene anyway, though, and was relieved when he got there and he saw Lowell on the front porch. You know, this big baby face boy mm-hmm. was sitting out on the porch, calmly petting and playing with his dog. The officer got out and said, hey, what's going on? And Lowell pointed to the door. He was still looking at the dog, didn't, you know, didn't look up. But he said, look in there. The officer said that he expected to see some trivial thing. But instead, he walked into the front door into a gruesome murder scene. Wow. The dead bodies of 20-year-old Jeannie Marie, 42-year-old Opal, and 50-year-old William Andrews lay shot dead. Mm. Jeannie Marie and her mother were in the living room, and Mr. Andrews was in the kitchen. We know that we shouldn't judge someone based on their reaction to I know, a death. But doesn't it just seem so weird? But like you always say, we do it anyway. Yes, we do. <laughs> and those officers were doing it. Sure. There was something just eerily calm about Lowell. They asked him, where, where were you when this happened? He told them that he'd forgotten his typewriter back at his room and house in Lawrence. So after Thanksgiving dinner, he borrowed his dad's 1958 Chevrolet and drove to go pick it up. While he was there, he chatted for a minute with his landlady and another boy who stayed at the room and house as well. He told them how that drive, you know, normally only took him about 40 minutes, but Mm -hmm. how it had taken him twice as long. The weather was pretty bad. It was snowing really heavily. Okay. And so it just took him some time to get there that evening. So he has a a partial alibi for Mm -hmm. some of that time. Yeah. And then when he left there, he actually drove over to the Granada Theater and watched the movie Mardi Gras. Then he stopped and got gas and came on back home. He even mentioned that he'd liked the movie. And when the officer asked him, what did you like about the movie? He said, I just happened to like it. But who knows? He could have been in shock. You know. I know, but. I know. You know, I don't think that. Anyways, he walked inside the house and that's when he found his family had all been killed in the house. And then the house was ransacked. And so he just assumed that it was probably a burglary. Lowell was polite and answered the questions of the police, but he was emotionless. Hmm. They were shocked when they asked him where he wanted the bodies to be taken once they were done processing them. And he said, I don't care what you do with them. Uh, okay. That is a red flag. Yeah. His whole family killed just died on Thanksgiving. He just leaves for a little while and comes home and his entire family is dead. That's a very strange reaction. Very. And I'm thinking, okay, so he's established an alibi Mm -hmm. of sorts. And you would think he would be at least overacting pretending yes i know it was like he didn't even ha- like he's not even trying to he's established an alibi but he's right. not even trying to act like he's concerned i don't know that's just weird it is yeah. the cops needless to say asked him to come down to the station with them for some routine questioning they just felt you know like we were saying something is off they offered him something to drink and he asked for a coke They went back over his story again. It did seem well rehearsed. Like you and I were just saying, he made sure that everywhere he was, somebody saw him. Mm. Somebody saw him at the gas station. Somebody saw him at the movie theater. Plus, when he went over to the rooming house, he spoke to the landlady and he spoke to another boy and told them how long it had taken him to get there. Yeah. See, he's putting a lot of work into that. But then why would he not continue that same level of effort to act concerned? Part of me thinks, well, maybe he just snapped, but he didn't just snap if he planned all that out. So right. I don't, I'm right. Like, it's, yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? So the Andrews family pastor, Reverend Dameron from the Grandview Baptist Church called into the station. He was the family's pastor, but he was also Mr. Andrews' best friend. They had grown up together as kids on neighboring farms. Mm. So he was very, very close with 
Mr. Andrews, with the family. He was very close, even with Mr. Andrews' mother. Mm. So it's a small town. News travels fast. And he had heard Mm. that the family had been killed. So on top of being shocked and absolutely devastated, he was worried about Lowell, you know, who was like a nephew to him. So the coroner at the time invited him to come down to the station to be with Lowell. When he arrived at the sheriff's department, they let the pastor in on their suspicion that something did not seem right. But the pastor assured him they had this wrong. Lowell loved his parents very much. He explained that they were a close family. And if there had been any issues, he would have known about it. Like if there had been something out of the ordinary. Like if they had been struggling with with him and having conflict. Yeah. He would have heard about it already. Right. He was their pastor, but also that was his friend. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so he just said there's nothing like there are no red flags. They told him they're like, well, we really would like him to take a lie detector test and clear his name. This is what always gets me about okay. these cases when people say, oh, there are no red flags that like, oh, he was the nicest kid or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm always thinking there had to have been some kind of red flag. There had to be something. I'm always looking for the person who's going to say, but this, that right. red flag. Right. Like, that's always what's in my mind. I'm waiting. So at the end, I want to hear what okay. I want to hear what you feel like the, the smoking gun is. All okay. right. The reverend asked for some time alone with Lowell. And they allowed it. And when he went in to see the boy, he put his hand on his shoulder and he spent some time through tears just expressing his sorrow and sympathy for him. The reverend asked what had happened. And Lowell just recounted that story that he had told police. Then the pastor said, Lowell, they want you to take a lie detector test to clear your name. And for the first time, he showed a little hint of emotion. It was like that was his clue, like, oh, maybe I haven't been I haven't know, convinced him enough. Convinced him. Okay. So he started to shed a little bit of a tear, and then he got quiet, and he looked down, and the reverend said, y- you didn't do this horrible thing, did you, Lol? If you did, now's the time to purge your soul. Three hours after the police arrived to his house, Lowell confessed to the reverend that he had been the one who murdered his family. Mm. Lowell was described by one lady in town as the nicest boy in Walcott. There you go. Yeah, the nicest boy. He had a Mm -hmm. newspaper route like a lot of kids did back in the 50s. He was always friendly to everybody. At Christmas time, he'd even bring candy to give out to the kids on his route. He was involved in the Grandview Baptist Church with his family. He was on the quieter side. He didn't have a big social circle, social circle, social circle, social (laughs) circle. Oh, my gosh. He did not have a very big social circle. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. He preferred to stay to himself, but that was actually his choice. It wasn't because he was socially awkward or because he didn't fit in or because people didn't like him. It wasn't really like that. You know, some people, they just don't have any social skills to be able to make friends. Well, that wasn't the case with him. He just preferred, he liked to read. He liked to study. He was very studious. He was an introvert. He enjoyed being alone. I relate to that, yeah. In one newspaper I read from the time, it referred to him as a brain. So I feel like that's a nicer word for he was a nerd. Yeah. You know, Lowell was a model student. In fact, he got record breaking grades at his high school. Like he was brilliant. He played the trombone in the college band while studying zoology. And he did seem to have some kind of special affection for animals The way he was with his dog that stood out to me. Acquaintances at the university he went to said they remembered him as very gentle and sweet. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't. He was highly intelligent. He read these Russian classics about philosophy and crime and murder and murderers. Lowell had developed this fantasy that turned into an actual plan to kill his parents to get his inheritance, which would have been $1,850 that his dad had in savings. 
And then the 240 acre farm. Just 1,800. Yes. Odd. Today's money, that would have been a little over 19,000, but still. Still not. But, but mean, the yeah. 200 and. 40 40 acres acres. that would have sold for quite a bit of money he would have made a lot of money off of that it was never clear to me I tried to find sources that would say if he had planned on selling the farm or if he was gonna continue to have it a work in farm because he was not gonna stay there his plan was to take the money to move to Chicago and become a mafia hitman what (laughs) yes wait I'm like So this nice kid, Mm -hmm. and he's got this plan. Like, where did this come from? This, like, if he's, I don't know. This is not adding up. Okay. Well, for months, he had actually been thinking of ways to kill his family. And he had to kill his sister, too, so that he could be sure to get all of the the money. money. Yeah. And he thought about poisoning them, and he actually thought about burning the house down. If but he, he's admitted to all that. Yeah. Oh, great. He's admitted to all this. But he decided that those things were too risky, that someone might see him buy the poison. One day when he was home from college, like on a visit, his dad was cracking walnuts and eating them. And he just got this epiphany. Oh, I'll shoot him and make it look like a robbery. So bizarre. So that's what he decided to do. And Thanksgiving he felt like would have been the perfect time because his sister would have been home for her Thanksgiving break. The whole family would be together. And of course, like I said, he needed her to die as well because he wanted to be the sole beneficiary Mm -hmm. of his father's estate. So after the family had their Thanksgiving dinner, Grandma Andrews went back home. Mrs. Andrews and Jeannie Marie cleaned up the mess in the kitchen before they went to the living room and they joined their dad, Mr. Andrews, to watch some TV. Lowell was upstairs in his room reading the brothers Karamazov. Carrie Mousoff. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? Yeah. So I'm trying to think of um, like in re- how, that, to, how it sounds in yeah. relation to that. Karamazov. I don't know. Anyway, something like that. I'm definitely not Russian. So this was a philosophical novel about a son that murders his father, questions God, free will, morality, all of those things. He actually finished up the last chapter of that book and around 7 p.m. went into the bathroom to shave, put on, in true gangster fashion, his best suit and got a semi-automatic rifle that he'd gotten for Christmas a few years ago. And then he also had purchased a Luger revolver, and he put that in his pants. Lowell then walked down and out into the living room where his family was watching TV with the lights off. He decided to use the rifle first because he needed two hands to hold it up. So he flipped on the lights, and when his sister turned to look at him, he shot her between the eyes and killed her instantly. Hmm. Then he shot his mother, and then he shot his father. Neither of them died right away. His mother tried to call out and come toward him, and he told her to shut up and shot her four more times. Can you imagine your son? I mean, like, oh, no. gracious. The dad got up. You know, he w- I'm sure he was disoriented. Well, yeah. And so he tried to go into the kitchen to run away, mm-hmm. and... His son shot him 17 more times. What? 17? 17 times. Shot his mother four times, shot his sister three times, shot his dad 17 times. And after he had shot the gun, I forget how many times he shot the semi-automatic, but after that, then he pulls out his Ruger and shoots it, I think, four more times. Like, that just does not add up. Like, he, if he's had no animosity whatsoever with his family, that he can do that. I'm just saying he's he's mentally ill and living in fantasy land is all I can figure. But He put that rifle away at some point and uh, pulled the Luger from his belt and used that to fire the last four shots. Then he walked around the house, messing things up and staging the robbery. Yeah, because somebody who breaks in to rob your house is going to shoot someone 17 times. Right. I mean. Then he got into his dad's car, that 1958 Chevrolet, and drove the 40 miles to Lawrence. 
He thought he was really smart, didn't he? Oh, he did. And then remember he told them, oh, it took me twice as long to get here. Well, the reason it actually took him so long to get there is because before he went to the boarding house to get his typewriter, he drove over to the north end of the Call River Bridge and walked out about halfway, disassembled the guns and threw them into the water. Mm. Then he went to the room, the movies and the gas station and drove back home. Before he called the sheriff's department, got his little Pekingese and got it some food and some water, took his dog out on the porch, went back in, called the sheriff's department, and then waited out on the porch with his dog for the cops to arrive. After he told the story, the reverend told him he thought it would be best to confess because he was telling all this to the reverend. Wow. But he told Lowell that he would stand by him no matter what he chose to do. And if he wanted to hire an attorney, he would help him in any way that he could. Really? Yeah, he did. I find that surprising. Mm -hmm. So Lowell told the Reverend Dameron to call him in. He might as well confess. So with the Reverend in the room, Lowell told the story to the assistant attorney, Robert Foster. Foster wanted to know, had there been any tension, you know, an argument that day? That's what I want to know. Not at all. The family had had a nice Thanksgiving. Lowell had failed sociology that semester, which was a surprise to his parents, but they didn't even reprimand him for it in any way. It just it was out of the ordinary, but they weren't upset with them. His mom kind of wanted him to be a normal kid. She worried about him spending so much time up with his books and Mm -hmm. You know, so I think she was probably like, okay, oh, he's a normal, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, like a gracious, yeah, gracious about it. Absolutely. And then they asked, did you love your family? He said, yeah. And then they asked him, had your parents ever denied you anything? Yes. And then he said, it wasn't a matter of they wouldn't give me what I wanted, but it was a matter of they couldn't give me what I wanted. Well, what is it that you wanted? They ask. Well, I would have liked to have had a sports car and I would have liked to have had a million dollars. It's just this yeah. is strange. They ask him, you know, how, how do you feel about this? And he said, I don't feel anything, period. That definitely he said, sounds like some kind of a mental illness. He said, I'm not sorry I did it and I'm not glad that I did it. I just don't know why I did it. There's a picture of Lowell that I'll post to Facebook whenever I get a chance of him taking the divers to the spot where he disposed of the guns. And he is just totally emotionless, just void. Lowell, of course, was charged with first degree murder, but pled innocent by reason of insanity. His defense set out to prove he was, in fact, insane at the time of the murders. If they succeeded... Andrews would be sentenced to the state hospital for the criminally insane instead of prison. Yeah. He definitely couldn't have even pretended, though, to have had any intellectual difficulties or disabilities. There was no doubt that he was highly intelligent. And I think he was too prideful to even act dumb. Oh, yeah. The murder spree was brief and was terribly brutal And it seemed like it was a one-off. You know what I mean? It wasn't Mm -hmm. like he was, there were any signs of violence before this, but it was, it wasn't done on impulse. It was clearly planned. It was. And by his own admission, it was premeditated and his motive was pure greed. Mm -hmm. And the book he was reading that night about crime and morality read that someone who was superior could murder people people that they considered morally below them for the greater good. And with these fantasies that he had about being a mafia hitman, Mm -hmm. Lowell spent hours being assessed by a man named Dr. Joseph Satin, who was a psychiatrist that specialized in sudden murders committed with little motive by perpetrators who appeared sane before and after the crime. But Lowell did not even try to play the game. He did not display any signs of regret or remorse. He just didn't have any cares to give about even about his own fate. 
And even though they tried like to encourage him to say that he was having yeah. some psychosis, like seeing some things, hearing some things, he would not do it. And all of his tests came back normal. Hmm. So maybe he was just evil. His psychiatrist ultimately said Lowell felt no emotions whatsoever. He considered himself the only important, only significant person in the world. And in his own seclusive world, it seemed to him just as right to kill his mother as to kill an animal or a fly. He understood what he had done when they get off by reason of insanity. Mm -hmm. It's because... They truly don't understand in that moment. Like they snap. Like, yeah, they really snap. Yeah. There is no, you know, there's no premeditation. They don't even really have a sense of right and wrong in that moment. For that brief but he did. time. And I was going to say, and that's clearly not the case. It's not the case. I mean, he understood what he had done. He knew that it was wrong. He knew that he would be punished for it. And that's why he did things like establish an alibi. Then a last ditch effort to save him, they diagnosed him with simple schizophrenia. Hmm. But. And maybe was that his defense that got the um, yes. psychiatrist to give him a label? I mean, they're trying mm -hmm. what they can to yeah. defend him. I think he was a psychopath. I was going to say which one of those, I couldn't remember if it was sociopath or psychopath that had this, but obviously there's some narcissistic uh, features there. Um, yes. But it has to go deeper than that. Yeah, but he doesn't have conscience. He doesn't have remorse, greed, you know, I don't know. And yet there, okay, so there has to have been signs of that when he was younger. I just fully believe there has to be something there. I wonder if he was spoiled. That's I was just I was listening. Say. I was just listening to an episode of, do you ever listen to The Art of Manliness? Have I you love ever, that podcast. I love that podcast. I just, I Brett McKay, that. he's, I, mm -hmm. I love him. Anyway, I was listening to um, an episode on there about narcissism, actually. And it's a lot of times parents can really feed into, I'm not saying, I don't want to victim blame, victim shame here. Everybody wants to do the best they can for their kids. Those parents probably grew up poor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if they indulged him. There has to be something behind closed doors. You know, maybe maybe he is being spoiled. Maybe he is pitching fits on Christmas because he didn't get what he wanted. Maybe. Right. I, you know, there just has to me. But I feel none like of that leaked out. None of that leaked out. The only thing, this, this was interesting to me that, you know, he really kind of was tight lipped mm -hmm. throughout the investigation. You know, I told you that the divers had come and they were like trying to find the guns. Mm -hmm. The only thing he said when they told him they couldn't find him, he was like ridiculous. Right. He like said, he, because he was so much smarter than them. He was and just they so aloof. It. They did say in school that he kind of maintained this intellectually superior attitude. You know, that also makes me think of the Parker home episode. Yes. The, the one. Yes. And the Leopold, Leopold and Loeb. Yeah, I was thinking of that too. This we should do that together. We should. The, he reminds me a lot of them because I feel like they were like that, had no conscience. Mm -hmm. So there are again those uh, traits that you yeah. can see in these. Intellectually, he thought he was you know Better. superior to, to everybody else, and. By his own admission, I guess, and by the books he read, you know, all these Russian classics about these gangsters and mobsters. I don't know if he had kind of just got into this fantasy world. It's the same thing with those girls mm -hmm. in the Parker Hume case. Especially the one who was uh, the very smart one. Mm -hmm. Her dad yes. was also extremely uh, intellectual. And she was. Okay, so this is another thing. With her... Me, you and I later had a discussion about the possibility of her being autistic mm -hmm. on the spectrum. Yeah, because she did have a hard time in social social skills skills, but he did not. So he preferred to be alone, but he did not have problems. I mean, over and over and over people, people enjoyed being around him. You know, he could have had a broad social circle if he had chosen, chosen to, to but i think he might have thought he was too too good too good maybe i mean maybe. that's just it's an assumption that i'm making yeah yeah 
It's so funny because everybody was like, the family was so close. The reverend, he said after the interview, I've spent all night with him and I cannot believe this. He said the parents loved their parents and the kids seemed to love their parents. He said this, ju- like he could not make sense of it. That The pastor said, I just think he went berserk. But he did. But he didn't. He didn't go. And two, maybe the pastor was so close to them Mm -hmm. that, you know, sometimes you can be so close to a situation. You just don't see what other people can see. I don't know. But it wasn't just the pastor. Yeah. Okay. So he had an aunt. She did everything she could to fight for him. She wanted him out of prison. Why? She just felt like that wasn't who he was, that it was just like he just went bizarre. Like he just had a break and... Uh, an aunt, either the mother or the father's sister was really uh, trying to support yeah, him, s- supported him through the whole thing. And, you know, his grandmother was alive. Yeah, after the this. one that had left after Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that he didn't kill her. I guess he didn't need to. Right. I mean, I don't guess he was. Do- he was like, I, I didn't do it because I hated him. He just did it. Because he just he did it the money. because he was the most important and he needed the money. So why not? Crazy. Okay. His defense failed. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to hang. Good. <laughs> he he did appeal several times or his, you know, attorneys appealed for him, but they were ultimately all rejected. Even on death row, he was aloof and unbothered. He would correct fellow prisoners on their grammar. <laughs> he spent his days reading Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, and Walt Whitman. When he wasn't reading, he would work on his scrapbook that he made, not of pictures of his family, but of different foods that he was fantasizing about that he cut out of magazines and pasted into a scrapbook. He was like, it was before this whole Facebook generation of taking pictures of our food. He was before a man before his time. He was. It's interesting. He was very smart on some levels and very childlike. And he was what, 18? And others. Yeah, but even the thing of like him going to run away and be a gangster. I know. That is a little bit like, again, you're living in fantasy land there and it's a little bit. um, Yeah. I mean, just like, yeah, Juliet Hume, who they remember they were going to go to Hollywood and they were going to become these famous actors. Yeah. So he definitely had some of that grandiosity. Yes. Which is. That's narcissism. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But interestingly enough, Lowell was at the Lansing Correctional Facility at the same time. I feel like we've talked about these guys at the same time as Richard Hickok and Perry Smith. Hickok and Smith were the two that murdered the Clutter family. Oh, but you're going to do that one, aren't you? At some point. Yes. Yeah. And so the author, Truman Capote. Yes. He wrote a book in cold blood about the Clutter family murders. Mm hmm. And he would go into the prison a lot and interview Hickok and Smith. He mentioned Lowell Andrews several times in his book. Hickok and Smith were, they were actually friends with Lowell. They were on death row together. Wow. Capote quoted Hickok as saying that he was a funny kid. He was always talking about breaking out of there and being a hired gun. When they would talk to him about, you know, death and getting right with God, he'd say, oh, I don't believe in that. Lowell said he didn't care if they hung him or not, that his life wasn't worth anything anyway. Hickok said he told Lowell that his problem was that he had no respect for human life, not even his own. And this was coming from another murder. Yeah, another murder. That's weird. Lowell has made appearances in movies about the cold blood murders. And then on November 30th in 1962, Lowell put that scrapbook to work and used it like a menu for his planning out his final meal. He had two fried chickens. He had French fries, a lettuce salad, a Coke, vanilla ice cream with strawberries, and a cigar. He was led to the gallows on November 30th at 12.01 a.m. in 1962. He declined to offer any last words or regrets. Some say he even had a slight smile on his face. A reporter said he appeared outwardly remorseless and disinterested in the whole event, aloof to the very end. Hmm. He hung for almost 20 minutes before he was pronounced dead. Some rumored that the rope actually broke 
and they had to like kind of redo the whole thing. Mm. That's never been confirmed, but he was one of the last to be executed in the state of Kansas. They buried him next to his parents Mm. and his sister in the Mount Salem Cemetery in Excello, Missouri. Lowell's tombstone is engraved with the word son. And that is the awful story of Lowell Lee Andrews. Wow. I have never heard that one. Isn't that terrible? It is it terrible. It is terrible. It's, okay, so I feel like kids need a lot of interaction with their families. Mm-hmm. Connect on an emotional level. My gosh, listen, I could write a full encyclopedia of things I did wrong. <laughs> but I. But this is one thing I guess that I'm glad that I did from the time that my kids were little. I always wanted to know how they felt. I always wanted them to know how how I felt. If I had made a mistake, you know, as far as maybe punishing them out of anger or something like that, like I would go back and try to explain that later. I was feeling like this. That wasn't right. We can't always go by what we feel. Oh, yeah. So that was, you know what I mean? Like I was wrong to do that. But and then if I don't know, like maybe somebody didn't get invited somewhere. Oh, you know that. Do you think that hurt their feelings? How, How would you feel if that were you? Just teach them to yes. feel for people to feel for other people yeah, yeah. And teach it to them train yeah. model it for like them. have them think about those things I, i'm not saying that my kids could never do anything like that because you know i'm sure everybody thinks that but i feel like my kids are so empathetic you see that in them which, yeah. which comes back to like what was he like really did did his parents notice that he didn't have any empathy did they right. like what was there that the public didn't see that would have been a red flag i'm thinking there had to be something are, are there people really who there are no red flags no signs whatsoever of being a sociopath or even having narcissistic tendencies are there people who display none of that and then all of a sudden can plot a murder like this i mean i personally yeah. don't think so but Honestly, I'm my, like, this one has perplexed me probably the most. Mm-hmm. A lot of times when I go back and listen to a, one of our episodes, I'm like, oh, I didn't catch that the first time. Or I have a different train of thought. I'm like, oh, I was thinking this, but now I'm thinking that. I right. hope you do that. Oh, yeah. So I'll be interested to see what I think when I listen to it again mm-hmm. in its entirety. But maybe he literally was just evil. I still firmly believe if even if that's the case, there were some signs somewhere yeah. along the way. Well, those sure were some hard times. They sure were.